Tom Brokaw, whose new book is called A Lucky Life Interrupted. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Tom, uh, the, the obvious first question, um, how are you feeling? Actually, I'm, I'm doing so much better, and I'm in remission. We just had a, ran the numbers again last week. Uh, the doctors are all very pleased. Multiple myeloma is a nasty cancer. It's not curable, but it's treatable, and I'm in the treatable uh, place right now, and we hope to keep it that way. I, I take a daily... Um, I take a daily chemo, uh, it's a right. low dosage, but that's my maintenance drug, and I'll do that for as long as it takes. One of the great uh, virtues of this book is that you are highly aware that you are Tom Brokaw and not like the average American. You have access and advantages right. in terms of dealing with the medical system that most normal people don't have. Um, there's a lot of advice in the book to those normal people about how they should approach the medical system. What are some of the pieces of advice, the lessons you've learned that everyday Americans can, can learn from? Do not walk into a doctor's office and think it's a Mayan temple speaking a language that you do not speak. Uh, inform yourself before you get there. Do not be afraid to ask a question. Don't worry about asking a stupid question. It's your right to do that. The other thing you need to do, which happened in my case, uh, serendipitously, our eldest daughter is a very smart, uh, very aggressive ER physician, and she became my consigliere, my ombudsman. She was there to take notes, ask questions, and the medical teams all came to like her a lot because she was so helpful in telling them about what was going on with me because she could read me in many ways better than I could at that point. Look, he's in more pain, he's telling you, that kind of thing. <laughs> so you get somebody who can do that for you. And then these days, you can go on Google and not read everything, but go to the good sites, the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Johns Hopkins, MD Anderson, if you've got cancer. Right. And they've got every cancer categorized. And you can find out what the latest stuff is and raise some questions with your primary uh, caregivers. Tom, you and I have both had a chance to be treated uh, and spend time at the Mayo Clinic. It's one of the great institutions of any sort in America. And as a journalist, if you're there, you can't help but try to figure out what makes it so good. So. What have you figured out that makes the Mayo Clinic such a supreme well, the, organization? I think the genius of it is was there's a man by the name of Dr. Plummer back in the late teens and early 20s of the 20th century who figured out they couldn't deal with the volume unless they got a system in place. He, was a, he had a great medical mind, but he also had an engineering mind. He's the one who devised the system of record keeping and then making sure that if you have a complicated case and you have two or three physicians, they're all looking at it at the same time and sharing information simultaneously. It seems like that would be no brain surgery, frankly, that everybody ought to do that. But it's one of the few places in the world where they have systemized it. So everybody knows what's going on simultaneously, and you don't have to run from place to place to place and then keep catching up. That's a big, big piece of it. And the other part of it is, quite honestly, the doctors who go there are paid on a salary. They're not paid fee for service. And they know what they're going to earn. They're not going to order up extra tests just because they're going to get a little extra money. They live in Minnesota. And every time I hear one of them getting an award of some kind, they unfailingly praise their colleagues. They say, I'm just so lucky to be part of the Mayo Clinic. So it is an unusual institution. And uh, I can't imagine why the rest of health care just doesn't take the model and copy it. This is not a book about uh, health care reform or about the Affordable Care Act, but you do offer a couple of comments, comments in the book about Obamacare. I believe you say it's, quote, too wide-ranging and too complicated. What does that mean? Well, I thought, you know, when you had 2,800 pages that people had to wade through that it was too complicated. I, I had been paying a lot of attention to health care reform at that point. You have to remember, I came of age when Medicare was being kicked in. And that was highly controversial. Right. The AMA was opposed to it. They said it was going to ruin medicine. Sure. And they rolled it out. Then I did a, a primetime documentary with Hillary Clinton, and I thought hers was too complicated. I would have thought that they should have been paying more attention to the economy at that point. And the second piece of it, because we do have to reform health care, let's start with the uninsured. Let's take care of those first, see what works, and get more input from the great institutions like the Cleveland Clinic and others. But it's massive, and people still haven't figured out what the costs are going to be altogether. We've got to do something about it. On the other hand, I also say in the book, the Republicans just took shots at it. They didn't come up with anything of their own. And that was a failure, I think, of their responsibility. Tom, what do you think the country's looking for in the next president? 
I, I really think that the country is looking for someone who can manage things well and that is re, uh, responsive to their concerns, especially in the middle class. This business of the American dream fading, if not going away altogether, is a very, very big concern, Mark, as you know. And I don't think that the last election was an extraordinary ideological shift. I said on the air that night, what they've said is, we're going to give the Republicans a chance. And if they don't get the job done, we'll find someone else who can. People are really looking out for some big philosophical shift. They're looking for a way to make the country work again the way that it should. I've been going around the country saying this country was built on a very big idea that we would all create a republic in which we'd all have a voice and a role. And the great story of America is our big ideas, Abraham Lincoln, the Roosevelts, uh, the World War II. We haven't had a big idea in American politics now for some time. We need a big idea that addresses the concerns of the, of the country is what I think they're looking for. That's my guess, Mark. Let me ask you one last question, Brian, uh, Tom, before we let you go about Brian Williams. I was just um, have a little right. Freudian slip there. You know, you were in, at, at the University of Chicago last month. You were asked about this, and you said basically there's a process in place, and we owe everybody, including right. on all sides of the issue, to let the uh, process play out. Um, I'm curious, just given that that's the case, and I know you're not going to offer a judgment about this, but what do you think are the key factors in ultimately reaching a conclusion about whether Brian can sit in that chair again? Uh, I'm not going to go there. Quite honestly, I, I, I'm going to go back to my original answer. There's a process in fairness to Brian and the family, in fairness to the people at NBC who are running this, especially in fairness to the people at NBC who show up every morning and go to dangerous places and work. Uh, let's let the process play out. And any speculation that I offer, even to you and you're my friend, pop. It's on the social media, and I don't want to go there. Well, God knows that's what I was hoping for. <laughs> I know you were. Right. We're looking for the pop on social media, but I totally understand your answer.